And I was like, the scripture is more real than we thought. The Catholic Church is getting all in one pot. But uh, this is just current, okay? I'm telling you current event, okay? Uh, the New York Times gives an example of that, but I would recommend to go to their official website. Then you'll see all those names there. Just look at our members, and then you'll find all those guys. That's the best evidence. But a simple one is the New York Times article, The Pope Blesses Business Plans. A new initiative brings the Vatican and CEOs together. But the best one is Avro Manhattan's book. And he will prove to you beyond a doubt that, these got, that the Catholic Church is Revelation 18 Babylon, where all the businesses, all the elites, will be under her tip and finger. Why do you think Revelation 17, they turn against her? They turn against their mommy. So much power, drunk on power. But this is by, uh, The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan with the subtitle, 2,000 Years of Wealth Accumulation from Caesar to the Space Age. It is a must-have book. I recommend that book. And this guy was writing from early 1900s. He was an aristocrat, brilliant guy, majored in economics too. So you know what he wrote? This is going to shock you. Long quote. Here we go. The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America with the Ambrose Bank, with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments with the Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust Company, and others. The Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, International Business Machines, TWA, etc., at a conservative estimate, these amount to more than $500 million in the USA alone. Remember, this is early 1900s. One person calculated when he wrote Vatican Billions. One person claimed, I calculated, he actually meant a trillion. By today's estimate. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may be gathered by the remark of a member of the New York Catholic Conference, namely that, this, that his church probably ranks second, or right, New York Catholic Conference, listen, that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Just one of their Catholic organizations. Another statement made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. The Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and U.S. Steel combined. And our roster of uh, Duis paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. The Pope, as a visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual of the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars. The scripture is proven to be true all the time, that the Catholic Church will be Babylon and that the merchants, that they'll be whale and that they are tied to her system. And I told you in the last teaching, the Catholic Church at the Vatican, they already were way ahead about the metaverse stuff. They were discussing stuff about that. Man, how about that? Your, your Bible's always way ahead of you. It's crazy. But look at that website, Council for Inclusive Capitalism. I encourage you to look at that. When you look at their membership, it will scare you. This is recent, up-to-date now. Avro Manhattan's early 1900, and I gave you a recent source for Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Why is that, it makes you wonder. Why is it that these people, 
uh, with the Vatican, they're going to do something like this. Look at Psalms 12. Psalms 12. Now, how many of you know about the famous passage in Psalms 12 about the words of the Lord being preserved? Yeah, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. That's not the righteous individual. That is referring to the words of God. Amen. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them, the words of God, from this generation forever. But do you know what the whole chapter is about? The whole chapter, for some of you who didn't know, is more prophetic than you think. The whole chapter is not about, listen up now, the whole chapter is not about the preservation of God's words. One of the verses is about the preservation of God's words, but it's a part of a larger context. Psalms 12 is about the prophetic future of what happened in the tribulation with the, with the Jews crying out to God for help, where the rich and wicked oppress the Jews in the tribulation. Verse 1, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They, the wicked, speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak words, narration, the great, their great narrative. Flattering, right? And it's vain. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. He's going to cut off their great narrative. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Narration. A narrative, a good narrative will outrun data. With our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Create your own world. Imagine. Metaverse. You narrate the future, etc., See, who will be our Lord? And that's what God's prophesying. God, God, Scripture is way ahead. They're doing their great narrative. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. See, they oppress the common people, especially the tribulation saints who fall into that. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. These proud, rich elites, they puff down at them, and then they use their words, their narrative, to put them down, but God says he's going to protect them. How? His sa their safety relies on his words, his narrative. God's great narrative is verse 6 and 7. That's the eye opener. You have no idea that when God says he's going to preserve his words, you have no idea that was something prophetic too. He was talking about his narrative. That's going to, because the whole context is outrunning the rich with their narrative. Why is the poor protected at the end? Why, are they, why can they stand? Why can they win at the end? Why would the Lord fight for them at verse 5? Because they rely on his narrative. You know what we're going by? His narrative. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Your life is dictated by this great narrative. That's why Satan wants his men, that's why these people want to play God. You go by my narrative. Isn't that mind-blowing? Verse 6 and 7 is just meshed in between. It's not a totally new, different subject. It's part of it. Because the last verse, verse 8, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. See, these rich people with their narrative. It makes you look Psalms 12 more differently now. How about that? But guess what? If you critique this narrative right here and say that there's mistakes, you're the sucker that's going to follow their great narrative, aren't you? You bunch of suckers, you. You know how, uh, isn't it interesting that these conspiracy, these globalists, they start to take over the world more in their power? When? What timing? When the first modern Bible version came out. What did Dr. Ruckman say? You remember my church history class, History of Bible Believers? What did Dr. Ruckman say? When the world fell into apostasy. When they critiqued that book. Wow. That man's a prophet, I'm telling you. Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11. You might say, really? God's narrative is that important? Yeah. 
our very universe, not metaverse, our very universe lives by his narration, by his word. But these evil people, they can't create their own universe through their narrative. They do a metaverse through their word, their narrative. You don't believe me? You think I'm stretching it? Go to Hebrews 11.3. The Bible says, through faith, we understand that the world, see that? Worlds. That's what mankind wants. They want to create their own worlds, right? Like a metaverse. But God's worlds were framed by the what? Word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. No wonder they made the metaverse and the great narrative follow along with that. They want to create their own worlds. Imagine our own narration. That's wickedness. That's evil. Evil, scary stuff. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. After all, who created the universe? What's his name? The Word. John 1. John 1. You know who the great narrator is? And sometimes you'll see that. They'll talk about the grand narrator in some philosophical circles or some stories that you hear about. They're referring that to some God. They're playing God. They're playing God, these people. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the what? Word. word. And the word was with God, and the word was what? God. Verse 3. All things were made by who? Him, the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. So Satan, he wants to imitate that. You notice that? He wants to imitate that. So, will Satan imitate that? Mm -hmm. Revelation 13. Why do you think your Bible says this? You know how you... Look at Revelation 13. You know how he got the whole world? How he controlled the whole world? Through his narration. Through his narration, he controlled the whole world. That's what these guys want to do. Look at this, Revelation 13. Why? What happened? If you look at verse 4, the Bible says, And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They worshiped him based on verse 5. And there was given unto him a what? Mouth speaking great narrative. Great things. Wow. Great things and blasphemies. And what? It's all contradicting God at verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Remember the steps of the great narrative? You know, you, you decide, right? You decide, you just, that's why they had that conference, to speak about it so that they can make decisions. And then what? Execute. So we make it come to pass. But it may have another meaning there. Look at what happens at verse 6. He, he narrates, verse 6, and then verse 7, executes. 7, 8, 9, 10. He executes. Tribulation saints get their head cut off. Yeah. How about that? That book is more alive than you think. Let me close it right here now. Uh, last gold mine, all right? This happened, remembered where? UAE, the Arab. The Muslim culture now is getting involved in this. As Islam, can they see this word over here? All right. So as Islam... When the Muslims get involved, they had their great narrative meeting over there at UAE, where the Muslims are now involved. Now, uh, remember, your pastor gave a theory. He's not sure. He mentioned that the false prophet might be a Muslim. The Muslims have a big play with the great narrative. Look at the false prophet. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, that, and he had two horns like a lamb. That's a false prophet. And he spake as a what? Dragon. Dragon. He had the same narrative 
as the dragon. So you know what? If the false prophet is Muslim, then that means the Muslims have to somehow play a part with the great narrative, pushing that agenda.